有了啊嗯，哎，那现在我理想，对呀，我理想这位里的那个。Hello everyone. Uh, now it's already uh, half past uh, two p.m. Beijing time. Um, very welcome, everyone, here to the LMA SMU 2020 event.、Uh, today is the first seminar of a series of three seminars.、Uh, today we'll have three wonderful uh, speakers, uh, which will、uh, share with you all、uh, their wonderful arbitration、uh, and lawyering、uh, practice, experience, and knowledge. But above all,、um, I have to say that this event is、um, wonderfully organised by LMA and SMU,、uh, London Maritime Arbitrators Association and the Shanghai Maritime University, and also co-organised、uh, by and with、uh, Shanghai Bar Association and the Shanghai Arbitration Commission.、Uh, now we have, before we have those three wonderful. Speakers,、uh, we have two、uh, welcome speeches.、Uh, the first one will be made by、uh, Mr. Bruce Harris,、uh, a full-time arbitrator with LMA and now the president of LMA. So I now hand over、uh, to Bruce Harris for the first welcome speech. Thank you very much, John.、Uh, I hope you can all hear me clearly. I take that as a yes.、Uh, forgive my dress. I'm on, supposed to be on holiday, so I've、um, not. I've forgotten to bring a tie with me.、Uh, but it's a great pleasure to greet you all and to welcome you to this, the first of three seminars in my capacity as president of the LMAA, the London Maritime Arbitrators Association.、Uh, I'm sure that these sessions will be very valuable to you, but I'm also sure. That they will help to develop the already excellent and、uh, rewarding relationship which the LMAA has with both the Shanghai Maritime University and indeed with the sh Chinese shipping market generally. For some years now, the,、uh, my predecessors, my、um, colleagues Ian Gaunt and Clive Aston. Who were presidents of the LMAA before me have visited China and the、uh, Asia Pacific region a good deal, forming ties that we in the LMAA value very highly. In particular,、uh, a very strong bond with the Shanghai Maritime University has been developed over the past few years, and it's a pity that we can't this year meet in person. But. I am confident that, despite the fact that we can't meet in person, these sessions will show that, thanks to technology, distance creates no difficulties.、Uh, on behalf of the LMAA, I want to thank the university and John Lin in particular, as well as our own Ian Gaunt and Clive Aston, for all their hard work in arranging these webinars. And I also want to thank all the speakers from whom we shall be hearing. They too have put a great deal of time and effort into their contributions, and speaking brilliantly, as I know they will, for 20 minutes or so, requires hours of preparation. We're also grateful to the supporting organisations: the Shanghai Bar Association, Shanghai Arbitration Commission, Shanghai International Shipping Institute, and the World Maritime University Shanghai office. And lastly. A big thank you to all those delegates attending, without whom these sessions could not possibly take place. I hope you enjoy yourself and get a lot of value, and I'm sure you will, from the speeches that you're going to hear. So that's all I wanted to say. With that, I'll hand back to John Lin. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Bruce. Uh, now we have the second welcome uh, speech uh, made by Professor Shi Xing. Uh, Professor Shi is the Vice President of Shanghai Mountain University. Now let's welcome Professor Shi Xing to make the second welcome speech. Dear Mr. Bruce Harris, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar jointly by London Maritime Attributes Association and the Shanghai Maritime University. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 is an unusual year due to the pandemic of COVID-19. Thanks to the joint efforts, it's our great pleasure to see the opening of this year's seminar as we schedule. Although it's a pity that we couldn't see each other in person. However, in the three webinars, all the participants will have a precious chance to share the knowledge and the wisdom of the experience. Arbitrators and the lawyers on the latest developments in maritime arbitration. I believe it will be very beneficial to your future work and research. Currently, under the framework of Belt and Road Initiative, Shanghai is setting up an innovative dispute resolution mechanism in the Lingang Special Area of the Shanghai Free Trade Law. Attribution is an important part of that system. I hope that the webinar will produce more ideas to the better development of maritime arbitration. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to extend our congratulations to LMAA for its 60th anniversary. We sincerely hope that the two institutions can further deepen the cooperation in the future and make more contributions to the shipping industry. Meanwhile, I would like to give my credit to Shanghai Bar Association and the Shanghai Arbitration Commission for their support for this event. Finally, wish the webinar a great success. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Xu. Uh, as Professor Xu has Reminded us, uh, this year is the 16th anniversary of LMA. Uh, it's a wonderful year and it's a unique year for that uh, purpose. Uh, we should have lots of celebrations around the world, uh, but because of the COVID 19, uh, we have to uh, meet online. But it's not a pity, uh, it's an honor. Um, now we uh, dive into uh, the three uh, wonderful uh, speakers and their presentations. And uh, the first one uh, will be made by uh, Mr. Ian Gold. Uh, Ian uh, needs a little introduction. Uh, he has long, for a long, long, long time uh, been a full time and a highly respected uh, arbitrator uh, with LMA. Um, Ian uh, was the president uh, of uh, LMA uh, and, and he, he has uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, literature uh, written. Uh, one of uh, that is a book highly respected uh, in the shipbuilding market uh, called The Shipbuilding uh, Contract and uh, Law. Ian is co-author uh, of that uh, wonderful book. Um, Ian also has extensive and intensive uh, experience in the Chinese uh, and the Asia Pacific uh, market and uh, has uh, done a lot of uh, wonderful arbitration cases uh, in relation to that area. Uh, Ian is not only uh, the first speaker of today's webinar, but also the moderator uh, of uh, today's uh, webinar, and he will control, not me, the three speakers, including himself. So now I'll hand over to Ian. But before that, I have to remind everyone you have received, well in advance, a bundle of materials of today's seminar and uh, uh, all the presentations and all the intro of the speakers are in that bundle. So if you want to refer to that bundle, uh, please feel so free. So now, Mr. Gold. 
Thank you very much indeed, John, for that introduction. And uh, uh, many thanks indeed to the organizers of this uh, seminar, in particular, Shanghai Maritime University. We have now cooperated with Shanghai Maritime University over a period of uh, three years, and this is the third year uh, of the lectures that we've been able to give. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to meet in person, as Bruce Harris has already said, uh, but it does give us an opportunity to test the technology which is being increasingly used in real arbitration proceedings. And uh, it uh, is comforting that we are able to speak at a distance of 5,000 or 8,000 kilometers uh, and speak in real time with confidence that our uh, speeches are going to be continuous. Um, 10 years ago, we could not have said that, that uh, internet connection was not sufficient to be able to hold a seminar in this way, but now uh, it is becoming increasingly the case. So it gives us an opportunity to um, address you at the Shanghai Maritime University, but it also gives us an opportunity to invite to this seminar a wider audience of people who are able to participate by uh, the webinar who would not otherwise be able to be present in Shanghai. Despite that, I very much hope uh, to be in Shanghai again soon and to be able to meet many of you personally. Um, the first of these seminars, as you know, is devoted to shipbuilding issues. The second, which will be in a week's time, will be devoted to charter party issues. And the third, which will be the week after that, will be devoted to procedural issues. So uh, we're hopeful of being able to cover a very wide area. Some of you may be specialists in particular areas of shipping law. Some of you may not be uh, shipbuilding specialists. Uh, others of you may indeed come from the shipbuilding industry or from banking where um, uh, in, in, in financing shipbuilding contracts uh, you will have a very very important stake and I will try to address some of the issues which um, uh, you may have. Uh, we're going to have three presentations uh, this uh, afternoon, morning our time. Uh, the first which I will give is devoted to refund guarantees uh, the second, which Andrew Stevens will give, will be particularly uh, refer to, to a recent English case which involved an English, uh, a Chinese uh, shipyard concerning a particular principle called the prevention principle, which has been involved in many shipbuilding cases in London. And the third will be given by Chris Kidd, who will talk uh, particularly about the issues arising from COVID and the extent to which they may be invoked by a shipyard or perhaps even by a buyer uh, to defer their liability and to prevent, for example, a shipbuilding contract being uh, cancelled as a result of delay. Um, I should mention uh, that this session is being recorded, so uh, the recording will be held, I think, by the Shanghai Maritime University and will be made available to uh, those who've registered and others who have not actually been able to participate physically today. So if I could have the first slide, please. Uh, in anticipation of the first slide, perhaps I can um, simply say something about the background to ship and its importance as far as the LMAA and China are concerned. Uh, when I started my career in shipping in 1979, uh, Great Britain was still a leading shipbuilder and indeed probably the leading shipbuilder rapidly being overtaken by Japan. In the course of time, over 40 years, uh, now uh, China has established itself as the world's leading shipbuilder, overtaking both Korea and Japan in terms of tonnage. And uh, that trend looks to be likely to continue despite some setbacks after the financial crisis of 2009. Many of the cases which arise from shipbuilding contracts placed in China by foreign buyers are governed by English law and uh, subject to arbitration in London. And there are good historical reasons for that. First of all, uh, that going back 40 or more years, uh, England, rather than the UK, uh, was the world's leading shipbuilder and uh, the body of law which was established around that industry has uh, served to be a template for 
international shipbuilding contracts in uh, many other jurisdictions. Uh, Britain is no longer a leading player in the shipbuilding business. It has all moved to the Asia Pacific region, but English law has remained the law of choice in international shipbuilding transactions and looks to be set to continue to, to be so. Even in jurisdictions like Singapore, English law is very often the chosen law rather than the local law. Uh, likewise, London arbitration has established itself in the maritime sector as the leading place to resolve disputes. And this is very clear from the most recent international statistics compiled by the law firm Holman Fenwick Willen, which shows that some uh, 80 to 90 percent of maritime, international maritime cases are heard in arbitration in London. Well, against that background, can I move on to the question? the specific question of refund guarantees. If I could have the first, the next slide, please. I should say that refund guarantees are extremely important in the context of a shipbuilding problem. In the book, The Law of Shipbuilding Contracts, which John Lynn has already mentioned, uh, the um, refund guarantee is described as the financial cornerstone of the shipbuilding contract project. And no uh, international shipbuilding project will these days be complete without a refund guarantee being issued uh, on behalf of the builder by a bank. <clears throat> there were times, a long when a buyer might have taken securities simply on the ship, which was under construction, and would have been able to acquire title to the ship as the ship was constructed. It is very rare now for a buyer to be able to take title under construction. And even if it did, in the context of uh, an insolvency of the shipyard, the likelihood is that it would have a very difficult chance in actually physically uh, laying its hands on the ship. So the refund guarantee has come to be uh, the, can you, could you go back on the slide please? The refund guarantee has come to be uh, the effective substitute for the, the claim on title, which used to be the main security available to the public. Uh, every shipbuilding contract, every international shipbuilding contract, which you will have come across and which I have come across, has involved a refund guarantee. And uh, behind the refund guarantee is, of course, a claim by the <coughs> bank, if it's called on its refund guarantee, against the shipyard because it doesn't give its services for free it charges a fee for giving them issuing the guarantee because it is at risk and uh, it will also take some form of counter indemnity and possibly cash security for issuing the guarantee but the buyer will not contract without the refund guarantee and what is the guarantee supposed to cover well primarily it's to cover the liability of the shipyard to repay the installments of the contract price, which are paid before delivery. Frequently, these will be at least 20% of the purchase price, paid in maybe four or five installments, and then finally the delivery installment will be paid on the actual delivery of the ship. <clears throat> so these are very substantial amounts of money which are being guaranteed. Um, there are two uh, scenarios. <coughs> One is, that the guarantee will cover uh, each payment. And it may be that even a different bank may issue a guarantee for an individual instalment. But it is now much more common for there to be a kind of guarantee facility where all the, pay the down payments, as they are paid, will be guaranteed by an umbrella guarantee. So as the down payments are made, then the guarantee will attach to them. And this is a much more satisfactory situation as far as the buyer is concerned, because it doesn't have to worry every time it makes a down payment uh, that a new guarantee is going to be issued. <clears throat> Secondly, it will cover the interest, because under the contract, if the shipyard has to refund the instalments because the buyer has cancelled the contract, then uh, interest will have accrued on those instalments up to, from the date that they are paid up to the date that they are repaid at the rate which is specified in the shipbuilding contract. In some of the shipbuilding contracts we saw before 
crisis of 2008-2009, the interest rates were in many cases very generous. Uh, we were seeing interest rates of 6 or 7% even above LIBOR, uh, which reflected the interest environment at that time. Subsequently, when these cases came to arbitration, interest rates had fallen to the sort of levels we have seen in the last 10 years. So that, uh, uh, but nevertheless, the, the contract actually obliged the shipyard to make uh, payments of interest uh, at the higher rates which were specified in the contract. Then after the award is made, assuming that an award is made in favor of the buyer, there may be further interest accruing until the payment is made by the shipyard or under the refund guarantee by the bank. So all those may be subjects of the guarantee. In addition, there may be circumstances where it is said that the guarantee also covers payments of damages uh, for a repudiatory breach of the contract by the shipbuilder. And whether the guarantee is intended to do that or not is really a matter of construction of the guarantee. The primary intention is to guarantee the repayment of the installments, which is a debt, rather than to repay or to pay damages uh, due to the buyer as a result of a repudiatory breach by the shipyard. But if you look at the text of many uh, refund guarantees, you will find that they are capable or arguably capable of covering damages for a repudiatory breach, which may not at all be the intention of the bank issuing the refund guarantee or of the shipyard who has asked for it. One thing which refund guarantees almost certainly will not cover are the post-delivery obligations of the shipyard to honour the warranty, the usually 12-month warranty, which is given for uh, the ship after delivery. If you want that guaranteed, as some buyers do, then almost certainly that will be the subject of a separate uh, guarantee. Could I have the next slide, please? <laughs> Well, what, what will give rise to a call under the guarantee? What are the triggers uh, which will entitle a buyer to make a claim under the refund guarantee? All this presupposes, of course, that the shipyard um, has not paid under the, uh, the underlying obligation under the shipbuilding contract. Normally, of course, first of all, a demand will be made on the shipyard, but it, that may not be necessary depending on the terms of the guarantee. All of you who know about shipbuilding contracts will be familiar uh, with the provisions which allow a buyer to terminate the shipbuilding contract. Those are the express provisions in the contract, which say that if there is a delay in the delivery of the ship beyond the contractual delivery date, um, in two circumstances, the buyer is entitled to cancel the contract. The word cancel is, is I use here. Uh, equally, shipbuilding contracts often use the word rescission or termination. But in this context, those three expressions, cancellation, termination, and rescission, mean effectively the same thing. There are two types of delay which may give rise to a right to cancel. One is delay. In including events of force majeure, uh, which could be a, a really very long period. But almost all uh, international shipbuilding contracts nowadays also include what's called a long stop cancellation provision, which will say that irrespective of force majeure, if the ship has not been delivered after, let's say, 270 days following the contractual delivery date, that the buyer will have a right to cancel. And the only exception to that will be where it was the buyer itself which has caused the delay. And Andrew Stevens will speak uh, to some degree about that in the context of the prevention principle. So that's one situation and indeed the most common situation in which refund guarantees have been called. <clears throat> the buyer terminates the contract for delay and calls on the refund guarantor to repay the installments. A second situation, which is in my experience rather less common, is if there is a deficiency in the contractual speed, or there is an excess of fuel consumption, or a deficiency in dead weight, which are three absolute critical factors in uh, the ship's ability to earn money and the amount of money that the buyer has expected. <clears throat> and each contract will say that above a certain margin, 
the buyer is entitled to cancel the contract. This is, of course, much more of a risk in the first of a series of ships uh, where the design may be new and where the, ship may not, uh, the ship's design may not yet have been proved. <clears throat> where you're dealing with a series of ships and you're dealing with the 10th ship in a series, then speed, fuel consumption and dead weight should not be a problem. And then there is a third situation that if the shipyard becomes insolvent, some, ship, some shipbuilding contracts, but not all, have specific termination provisions which say that if there is a shipyard insolvency, and that has to be carefully defined <clears throat> by reference to the insolvency regime in the country of the shipbuilder, or there is a work stoppage, for example, of two months and nothing happens, then the buyer is entitled to terminate the contract. But not all contracts provide for that. Um, in some contracts <clears throat> where there has been, for example, a complete stoppage or the shipyard has taken on too much work and has not been able to do any work on the contract for, let's say, three months or six months or something like that, it may be that the buyer will then allege that there has been a repudiatory breach of contract by the shipyard and that it is entitled to terminate the contract, accepting the repudiatory breach and to sue for damages. It's not reclaiming the installments at that point, although they may form part of the damages, it is making a claim for damages. And it is a matter of construction as to whether the refund guarantee is going to respond to that claim for damages. Can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Well, what would be the conditions for the termination of the bank's liability under the refund guarantee? Because banks don't like issuing uh, <clears throat> obligations, letters of credit, whatever it is, without some sort of clear date by which their uh, liability and obligation stops. And, and no less is this the case for refund guarantees. And so the refund guarantee will ordinarily terminate on the earliest of these dates, the first will be a specific date, that is the 1st of January 2022, for example, which will be fixed to be 30 or perhaps as long as 60 days after the long stop termination date in the shipbuilding contract. And that is to make sure that the buyer will be able to exercise its right of termination and following the exercise of the right of termination will have 30 days in which to make a claim under the refund guarantee. So that will always be the, the basis of the, the date, the, uh, which is the date specific in the uh, refund guarantee. It will also terminate on the delivery of the ship. And assuming the ship is delivered before the explicit date, then the bank's liability will terminate then. It will have no liability for the warranty claims which the buyer may make after delivery. Or if the parties agree to terminate the shipbuilding contract, they may have good commercial reasons for doing that. Again, the bank will be off the hook. Or if indeed the uh, shipbuilder is able to refund all the guaranteed payments, then again, there is nothing left to guarantee. Now, you have to be very careful about this because <clears throat> uh, there are sometimes uh, attempts to change this wording and I am currently involved in a case where the wording has been changed when a delivery date was extended from the earliest to the latest of these dates. And this has presented the shipyard with a, a massive problem because the uh, issuer of the refund guarantee could remain on the hook, liable under its refund guarantee for an extremely long period. The buyer had good commercial reasons for asking for this but it is not conventional. And it is uh, almost always the case that the bank's liability will terminate on the earliest of these dates. And that will be explicitly written into the refund guarantee. And when you're looking at a refund guarantee in the context of negotiating a shipbuilding contract, you need to be very careful about that. And if you're a shipyard, you need to make sure that the bank issuing the refund guarantee will be prepared to issue a refund guarantee on the basis of the text which you have agreed with the buyer. Because if you agree with the buyer some specific modification to the form of refund guarantee which you know your bank is going to be able to issue, you're going to be in trouble because you may not be able to persuade the bank to issue a guarantee in the form which has been agreed with the buyer. Can I have the next slide, please? 
<clears throat> what sort of guarantee is this refund guarantee? And there are essentially two types of guarantee which are recognized by English law in commercial uh, cases. One is what we would call um, a, primarily, a primary liability. That is uh, that you as guarantor are liable essentially on the same basis as the, uh, as the, uh, the party for whom you have given the guarantee. An alternative is that you as guarantor are liable secondary only if it can be shown that the party for whom you wish the guarantee is indeed liable to pay the guaranteed obligation. <clears throat> and uh, this is expressed quite often in recent cases as being the difference between a performance bond, on-demand performance bond, and what's called a C2IT guarantee. A performance bond is essentially a primary liability of the issuer. A C2IT guarantee is a guarantee uh, where the guarantor undertakes effectively to, to ensure that the party guaranteed, or party for whom the guarantee is issued, does actually do what it's supposed to do under the contract. Now, performance bonds are much more commonly issued by banks and financial institutions than c to it guarantees. c to it guarantees are perhaps much more common where the guarantee is given by, for example, a parent company for the obligations of it. And we'll come uh, shortly to a series of tests which have been adopted by the courts as giving rise to a presumption as to whether a guarantee instrument, a guarantee document, is a performance bond or a C to it guarantee. These are commonly known as the Paget test because they were laid out in a uh, text uh, um, on banking law uh, written by a gentleman called Paget. And there are four of these tests which I will come back to. Uh, but uh, the most common uh, this point of distinction between the performance bond and the c to guarantee is that the performance bond is much more commonly issued by a bank and a c to it guarantee by a um, related party such as a parent company. Does it matter really whether the refund guarantee is a performance bond or a c to it guarantee because the refund guarantee even if it is a performance bond an on-demand bond, will almost always have a, a provision in it uh, which will say that uh, the liability of the guarantor will be postponed uh, until the result of an arbitration is known if uh, the shipyard, as is commonly the case, challenges the right of the buyer to claim under the guarantee uh, in arbitration. Um, so it, it will not be until the a buyer has proved its right to terminate the contract, for example, that the guarantor will be, will be liable. So the distinction may be much more one of form rather than substance. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, how to deal with changes in the underlying shipbuilding contract. This is a common issue because it's, it's, not, um, it's, it's often the case that the parties agree to delay the, the contractual delivery date of the ship, uh, that's a, for their own commercial interests. And the question arises, does the guarantee continue to bind the guarantor if the contractual delivery date, for example, has been extended? And um, most parties would say, most buyers would say that they will not agree to that extension of the delivery date unless they get an explicit extension of the refund guarantee confirmed by the guarantor. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, the brief extensions of the delivery date I mentioned already, and there was a rather controversial case recently, which may be invoked again in future, where the parties agreed to extend the delivery date, as a result of which the, the shipyard was also supposed to get the, uh, the refund guarantee extended. Uh, it had difficulty in doing that because it couldn't probably provide the collateral spirit for bank required. And um, it, uh, left it until the very, very last moment to, give the, to, to get the extension from the bank. The buyer terminated the contract on the basis said that if the guarantee was not renewed within 14 days of the expiry of the guarantee, 
that was a repudiatory breach on the part of the uh, of the ship but because the buyer could invoke arbitration at almost any time including after the apparent expiry of the original guarantee this is not a repudiatory breach um, the, the a buyer by claiming the repudiatory breach and terminating the contract was itself in repudiatory breach of contract. Now this will not always be the case and it's clear that this case was not intending to lay down general principles because you have to look very carefully at the arbitration postponement provisions in the guarantee uh, to see whether uh, the guarantee can be revived as a result of an arbitration relating to the non-extension of the guarantee. Um, I'll pass over that and uh, can I have the next slide please and we'll quickly come to a conclusion. Arbitration or court. It's been a matter of controversy in the past as to whether refund guarantees should be subject to court jurisdiction or to arbitration. Um, my suggestion as an arbitrator, you might not find that surprising, is that it's preferable for the refund guarantee to be subject to arbitration. There are a good number of reasons for this. Um, one of them is confidentiality of the proceedings, unless there is an appeal. Um, the parties may not want the, the general public to know that they're in dispute. The degree of finality in the arbitration proceedings, particularly if you expressly exclude the right of appeal on a point of law. It's easier to serve the notice of arbitration than it is to serve uh, court proceedings in many cases. It's very easy to start an arbitration and extremely cheap. All you have to do is to appoint your arbitrator. It costs 350 pounds. And above all, uh, arbitration awards can be enforced much more readily under the New York Convention in over 150 countries, including China, uh, than can court um, judgments under bilateral treaties, of which there are relatively few. Can I have the next slide, please? Well, what has happened in practice? There have been many cases in China where there have been claims on, under refund guarantees, particularly in the aftermath of the financial crisis when shipyards had often taken on far too much work, um, were not able to deliver the ships on time, and after the financial crisis, the buyers were not very interested in taking them. So uh, the buyers uh, would terminate the contract for delay and claim under the refund guarantee. Um, and the uh, course which was taken by some shipyards in China in particular was to go to the local courts in China, to the local maritime court and say, um, this uh, contract is in some way tainted by fraud. And uh, that might have been, for example, because uh, the shipyard had, uh, oh, sorry, the, the buyer had agreed with the manufacturer of the main engine to supply an engine which was second hand rather than new as happened in the Splithoff case which is on an earlier slide or whatever and uh, that uh, the maritime court then might issue an order restraining the Chinese bank from paying out under the refund guarantee and that is what the situation the Bank of China found itself in in the Splithoff case that I mentioned. They, that, those proceedings came to the English court and the English court said the Bank of China must pay, although it also said that it would recognize the decision of the Qingdao Maritime Court if it properly construed what that order said. There was some dispute as a matter of Chinese law as to what the effect of that order was, and the English court heard um, evidence, uh, expert evidence from Chinese lawyers um, as to what that, uh, that um, order of the Qingdao Court actually said. Um, ultimately, that case in China went to the Supreme People's Court and the Supreme People's Court threw it out. It said that the shipyard was not justified in its claim in trying to restrain the payment out under the, under the refund guarantee. Could I have the next slide, please? Well, uh, what is the form of the refund guarantee? Very often it's dictated by banks. If you go to a bank like ICBC in China or Cookman Bank in Korea, they will probably have their own preferred form of refund guarantee and the shipyard will be uh, well advised to consult with its bank before offering a particular guarantee to the to the buyer but there is no internationally standard form uh, the very common form of shipbuilding contract uh, originally formulated by the uh, shipbuilders association of japan uh, which with adaptations is widely used in china 
does not have a refund guarantee attached to it. The BIMCO um, uh, new build con form does have a form of refund guarantee uh, attached to it, and that might form a basis uh, for the, the refund guarantee in your ship building projects. There are also standard ICC promoted uniform rules on demand guarantees, which you sometimes also find incorporated in the refund guarantee. There are drawbacks from doing that. Can I have then the last slide, please? <clears throat> now, we've been talking about refund guarantees. Those are the guarantees given by uh, or on behalf of a shipyard for the repayment of the form. It is quite commonly the case in the other side of the transaction that the shipyard will ask for a guarantee to be given by the buyer or the buyer's bank for the payment of the installment uh, before delivery. And that may also form part of the financing of the shipyard if it would be able to assign that guarantee uh, to its bank. There have been a number of cases recently, also involving Chinese shipyards, uh, where claims have been made on these forms of guarantee. And again, these Paget tests which I mentioned have come into play. The four Paget tests, very briefly, are that there is a presumption that a guarantee will be treated as being a primary security, a performance bond, an on-demand instrument. If um, it's an international transaction, uh, involving parties in two different countries, if the guarantee is issued by a bank, um, if the undertaking is expressly to pay on demand, and fourthly, if there are no clauses in the guarantee um, providing for the defences, excluding, I'm sorry, the defences, which would be available normally to a guarantor, for example, on the basis of a change in the underlying transaction. And um, in some of those cases, in some of the cases, two, two cases can be contrasted here, the Wuhan logistics against Empiriki Bank, Empiriki Bank being a Greek bank who provided a guarantee for a Greek buyer. Um, in that case, it was held that the uh, guarantee was a primary security, an on-demand bond, and therefore that it was not necessary for the buyer to prove that the instalment had fallen due. And that was a big advantage to the shipyard, of course, because um, it, it avoided the need for a long arbitration or trial involving witness evidence to show uh, that, for example, the classification society had been present when the uh, steel cutting certificate was, was issued. You can contrast that with another case which was decided earlier this year, the Shanghai Shipyard against Rainwood International, where the English court decided that the guarantee given for the instalment payments was not an on-demand bond, that it was a kind of see to it guarantee. In this case, it was not issued by a bank, and therefore the Paget presumptions didn't apply. If you have to prove that the instalment is due, what is the proof? Is it substance or form? I had a case uh, a while ago where quite clearly the steel had been cut. Uh, there was evidence that it had been cut in the presence of the Classification Society surveyor, but the certificate issued by the Classification Society didn't say that the steel had been cut in the presence of the Classification Society surveyor. It could be proved by other means, um, and, uh, but the controversy arose because the buyer said that the instalment was not due because the certificate didn't uh, follow exactly the form which was stipulated in the contract. The arbitration was, of course, confidential, so I can't tell you what the result was, but the, uh, the, 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 the point is one which has to be uh, guarded against. Um, a further case uh, involving uh, the Shagan uh, steel conglomerate um, is, is an interesting case where the court agreed and accepted that a guarantee issued on behalf of uh, Shagan by its principal shareholder had not been properly authorized according to Chinese law. And um, this was a very big guarantee for some of about $70 million. And um, it was interesting that the, Chinese, uh, that the English court took great account of the fact that this, uh, the, the, the personal share of this company had had um, with this company. So I'll stop there. I, I'm conscious that I've overrun my time. We will have some time for questions and answers later, either through the chat function or otherwise. And I'll at this point hand over to Andrew Stevens. I can introduce Andrew by saying that he is a, um, a, a leading member of the uh, English Bar, 
his chambers are very much involved in shipbuilding contract cases, many of which, of course, involve China. He's recently been involved in a very large arbitration concerning a Chinese uh, shipyard. Um, he also has a good deal of experience of uh, both living and working in China. And uh, I'll hand over to Andrew to tell us something about uh, the case in which uh, he has recently been involved in the uh, on appeal in the English court. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. That's that's very kind of you. If um, if you can't hear me, do wave. But I trust everybody can can hear me fine. Great. So hello to everybody. Thank you to Shanghai Maritime University and the LMAA for inviting me to take part in this event. I can also see on Zoom on the platform that there are many friends in the audience. So thank you to them and thank you to everybody for joining and, and taking the time to take part. As Ian has mentioned, I uh, do a large amount of maritime work. but I'm also very lucky to do a lot of uh, pure construction, energy infrastructure work. And what we're going to talk about today um, is a principle, um, it's probably right to say from construction, pure construction and how it applies or not in, in shipbuilding and the most common form of, of shipbuilding uh, contract. Um, the case itself that we're going to touch upon uh, uh, arises from, if you can hear some noise in the background, there are building works going on outside. I don't know if you can hear that, but I apologize in advance. Um, uh, the case arises out of uh, 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 an SOE which operated a yard entering into 14 shipbuilding contracts, 11 of which led to arbitration seated in London and two of the arbitral awards uh, were appealed to the High Court. I should say that, um, or I can say because it's, it's mentioned in the judgment that, uh, that Ian Gaunt was one of the arbitrators uh, in the award that got appealed to the High Court and no doubt he, I'll spare his blushes by saying uh, his award is upheld um, uh, but we'll, we'll come on to that in, in due course. So we're, we're going to talk about the prevention principle and that's why the talk that I'm going to share with you on the screen is called uh, Preventing Shipbuilding. So what are we going to cover? Uh, first of all in the brief time that we have, we're going to look at the SAJ form and extension of time provisions, notice provisions and termination. To do that, we need to have a think about the basics, the ecosystem of the SAJ form, as I call it, and, and the basics of a construction contract in general, what the parties need it to achieve. Then we're going to look at the, this, this very important case that I think all yards need to be aware of. Thirdly, we're going to touch on the prevention principle, what it is, how it fits in, and fourthly, if time, although there probably won't be, we might say something about remote hearings because a lot of, lot of the hearings in, in uh, the Jiangsu Groshen case were remote, fully remote or hybrid. Why does this matter to, to, uh, to the audience, to you listening? Well, as Ian has mentioned, China is the, if not a, if not the major market for uh, shipbuilding. And this is a key case for yards, of things to do, things not to do, traps to look out for in any troubled or even non-troubled uh, shipbuilding or on offshore construction contract. It arises at the, the, the issues arise at the drafting stage, but also as disputes start to arise. Why do remote hearing tips matter? We're in the age of COVID or post-COVID for some, uh, and uh, remote hearings are and probably will be far more, far more common. Uh, so, a reminder of the basics, many of you will know this, but it's surprising how useful it is to think about the basics of a construction contract. What you want a construction contract, what one wants a construction contract to do in relation to delay, is firstly tell the parties in what circumstances, by which events, the buyer can recover uh, liquidated damages. Now that's a really important remedy for buyers because it's an easy thing to get. They don't have to prove their loss. So it's an important thing to be set out in the contract. How do they get it? When are they entitled to it? The next bullet point I've got is in what circumstances does, does delay permit termination? Now, this is obviously very important. Um, when can this contract be brought to an end, potentially against the will of one of the parties? Uh, that has to be set out and dealt with in your contract. Which delay events allow a builder more time? Now that's obviously very helpful to a builder to get more time, but it's also helpful to the buyer 
to know when the builder has been given more time because then they know whether they can terminate or not for delay. And of course, terminating just one day too early in a way that isn't unlawful could be a very costly mistake. So of course you want this third point to be made very clear. Also the sort of flip side of that, which delay events do not allow a builder more time? Obviously important again for both parties. Getting a little bit more detail now, is notice needed of the event, the delay, or the fact that you're claiming an extension of time? Uh, that's usually dealt with in, in the contract, and, and it relates back to the importance of knowing how much delay has arisen, how it knocks on to the termination right or the recovery of liquidated damages. And part of that is knowing whether notice is required as a precondition to any extension of time. But underlying all of this, something that's not often written out expressly in the contract, is the idea or the principle that an owner should not be able to cause delay to the project, which then gives it a right to terminate. Now, I say that they are all packaged within a construction contract. Um, the next slide I'm going to show you tries to summarize the SAJ form, the SAJ form, and how it works. I try to use tables and cases for my own notes. I try to use cases to present to tribunals in a, and courts in a simple way. Um, uh, I try to use these tables to present in a simple way um, how things work on one page so that you're not waffling on for a long time over multiple pages of submissions. So hopefully this is a handy slide, but it breaks every rule in my book for how not to, to present a PowerPoint slide that is overly complicated. There we have it. It's, it's a beast of a slide. Hopefully you'll, you won't see too many of these in your times watching webinars, but I think by the end of this, you might think this is an extremely useful tool to take away and implement in your practice if you're dealing with construction contracts, especially this SAG form. So there are 10 things I want to point out to you on this, on this slide. The first thing on the left-hand side of the screen, as you look at it, there are three boxes. Um, the first one allows an extension of time, so I've written EOT. And, and in the jargon, we're talking about excluded delays. The second one, second one down, permissible delay, also permits an EOT. The third one down, uh, no EOT, called non-permissible delays. And you see each of those three categories have a big rectangle in bold uh, lines that extend off to the far side. So, so starting with the top one, uh, where an extension of time is given uh, for uh, excluded delays, um, essentially what we're talking about in the next sell along is things that are the buyer's fault, often the buyer's fault or things that have been agreed or some kind of combined action. So uh, we have modifications that are requested by the buyer, I've highlighted that, delayed buyer's supply items, obviously something that's the buyer's fault, uh, buyer's failure to attend C trials, um, buyer's default in inverted commas, I've highlighted. Note that if you look at the third column along that's article I've written article 11 there. Um, I may have meant another article, but we'll, we'll call it article 11. Uh, and, and in the red box, you can see uh, no termination right. Uh, so of course, it makes sense that if there are things that the buyer have done, the buyer shouldn't get a right to terminate for things that are its own fault. Let's look at the next category down. This is a very big box um, for permissible delay and what we're looking at, if you look at the first few bullet points, war, blockade, strikes, high and low temperatures, they're force majeure type events. Uh, things, if you think of force majeure, they're often things beyond the control of the parties. But note, I've highlighted, yellow highlighting some wording, other causes beyond the control of the seller. So although force majeure is often events beyond the control of the parties here, the word beyond the control of the seller, the seller appears, not parties. Um, does that mean that for this category, a delay caused by the buyer can be a permissible delay that might lead to a right to terminate? We'll leave that question hanging. Uh, across one column, uh, I've written Article 8.1 and Article 8.2. Look at 8.2. So Article 8.1 is this permissible delay, force majeure type events. Article 8.2 is an, a provision that requires uh, notice of the delays as a prerequisite to an extension of time. We'll come back to the yellow box in a minute. 
third category down, non-permissible delay. You don't get an extension of time for this. Basically, it's all the rest lumped together. You don't get an extension of time if you're the builder. The builder is on risk. Look at the green box. Uh, after 150 days of this type of delay, subject to an asterisk, the buyer can terminate. Look at the yellow box. The yellow box spans both of, of these two categories. And it says after 180 days, now the, the days, the number of days and the, the exact number of the provisions differ from SAG form contract to SAG form contract uh, as they're amended and, and, and changed for each project. But sticking with, with what's in this particular contract, 180 days, uh, any combination of permissible delay or non-permissible delay, so it could be 180 of one and zero of another, permits termination by the buyer. Now, uh, remember something that the buyer uh, has done, you don't necessarily want to give rise to a right for the buyer to terminate. So I'll, I'll point out the asterisks here uh, in the yellow. Uh, what is excluded from the 180 days is default in performance by the buyer. Um, maybe difficult to keep up with uh, for people who are new to this, maybe not. For those who are familiar with this, you'll be getting in a nutshell what these contracts are all about. But just whilst we're on the topic of this asterisk, excluding from the count of 180 days, buyer default or default in performance by the buyer. Let's link back up to the very first uh, group and buyer's default that I've highlighted. Does that mean that? Is it excluding that from the 180 days or is it excluding something else? We'll come on to this, right? So that's a, that's a whistle-stop tour of how the SAJ form works. I'd encourage you when you're working on cases to try to put the table like this together as an ed memoir to help you remember when you come back to it and also for presenting in, in, in hearings. So what we're going to look at next is the law as it was uh, uh, from 2015 and a case called Joe Shan, uh, which was always cited in shipbuilding arbitrations and hearings. Uh, and what Mr. Justice Leggett, as he then said, as he then was, said, uh, Article 8.1, which in that case included the words other causes beyond the control of the seller. Remember, I highlighted that in the force majeure style delay. Uh, he said that that covers events with the character of force majeure. Great, that matches what I just told you. He said it does not deal with buyer's breach delays, which would make sense because you wouldn't want 180 days or how many days to permit termination. He said they're dealt with elsewhere. Uh, it would be odd to deal with buyer's breach delays. So this is the asterisk I was pointing you to. It'd be odd to deal with buyer's breach delays under both Article 11 and Article 8.1. And uh, he pointed to the presumption against a party's own breach, the buyer's breach, allowing termination. Article 8.2, remember I pointed you to a notice provision uh, for 8.1 delays. He said Article 8.2 notice is only required for Article 8.1 events. Makes sense. And then he said, Article 8.3, um, the asterisk, the exclusion of by default is only a reference to Article 11. And he said this classification, these three boxes that I showed you, covers the whole field. Great. So now I invite you all to think to yourselves about how you would advise a yard in this scenario. So let's say we're advising a yard who's entered into six SAG form shipbuilding contracts, um, all of them with the owner, so there's no issue about being with different, um, different counterparties for six con consecutive uh, new builds to be delivered. Uh, the yard has one slipway and the vessels are built in a line in pairs and the buyer, let's say, wrongfully terminates hulls one and two, which blocks the slipway uh, and, and prevents progress on three and four. And your client, the yard, asks you about numbers three and four. Um, has what the buyer done amounted to an Article 8.1 event, you know, this force majeure uh, style event? Uh, if it's not an Article 8.1 event, is an Article 8.2 notice needed? So have a, have a think about that whilst I flick to the next slide. Now, of course, in Joe Shan, uh, the answer was uh, Article 8.1 covers force majeure style events, things beyond the control of the parties. So would these facts, something done by the buyer, fall within that consideration of Article 8.1? But ask yourself, if it doesn't fit within Article 8.1, what kind of event is it 
what does it fall into under the contract? Because this contract, the way it's set up, is supposed to cover the whole field. Um, we'll come back to this. Is this where the prevention principle should step in? This year, Mr. Justice Butcher decided that Article 8.1 actually goes beyond force majeure. And these words, uh, beyond the control of the seller, mean that it captures this event, this event by the buyer. And he points to a rule of construction saying that extension of time provisions uh, should be read broadly so as to capture events. And he, he sort of gets that from cases on the prevention principle. So this is where we need to look at the prevention principle. Something that's not really taught at undergraduate level or at law school, it certainly wasn't taught to me, but actually it's, it's, it's literally fundamental. It, it, it underlies construction law and construction contracts. So it's an old principle. Uh, recognized in, in construction law, where a builder is not allowed extra time if prevented by an employer. Um, uh, and that extra time is allowed, it, uh, allowed to it if, if it's an event not provided for in the contract. So essentially, the prevention principle is filling the gaps in the contract. And, and what it does, is it puts time at large. So that's giving a reasonable time, extra reasonable time, to the builder to complete. So that might mean that LDs are pushed back. Uh, it might mean that the termination right is pushed back. Does it mean there's no termination right? It could do on the facts. Um, does it mean there's no certainty? It becomes difficult, you can see, for a, a buyer to know when its rights of termination have arisen if there's this reasonable time floating around. Um, but the case law makes clear that extension of time provisions, although I've said they're very helpful to a buyer, uh, sorry, to the, to the builder to know how much extra time it's got. They're actually for the benefit of the buyer. Uh, that's what the case law says. The extension of time provisions have essentially been written in to cover over the prevention principle so that the, the prevention principle does not crop up. The contract deals with everything. So they benefit the employer, the buyer, the owner in giving certainty. A, 27, a 2007 case multiplex dealt with this and you can see there's a tendency in the case law to, to avoid the prevention principle applying. And we can see that Mr. Justice Butcher said, what the present case has highlighted, so the, the scenario that I showed you roughly, has, it's highlighted however, that there may be other buyer's breaches, including, I think somebody's phone may have just gone off, off mute. Uh, 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 what the present case has highlighted, however, is that there may be other buyers breaches, including of the implied term as to non-prevention, which cannot readily be considered as being provided for elsewhere in the contract. Well, if, if it's not provided for elsewhere in the contract, one might say, well, that's where the prevention principle kicks in. But the upshot of this, if you're drafting a contract and you're, you're tinkering with certain wording, beware, because changing the word parties to seller, whether I think the statute actually says seller, just changing that wording can have a huge consequence on what events are covered uh, or not covered by the extension of time provisions. Often the prevention principle, I think, is seen as a, as a kind of last resort, desperate argument. Not always the case. Um, but uh, bear in mind that there's a, 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 a lot of arbitrators and tribunals aren't so fond of the of the prevention principle. So you're probably going to fall within an extension of time provision. So beware of, of what that extension of time provision requires and give notices. This is the key message from this case for Chinese yards. Give notices, read your contract, know it very well and give notices. So the next question that I asked in this scenario was, um, uh, if, if this is not an Article 8.1 event, do we need to give Article 8.2 notice? Now, Mr. Justice Leggett, as he then was in 2015, uh, said that, uh, no, Article 8.2 only applies to 8.1. The answer from the Jiangsu Guoxin case is uh, yes, uh, on the natural meaning of the words, Article 8.2 notice is required generally, unless there's some other notice regime that's applicable. So now that's quite tricky for yards. You've got to work out, does Article 8.2 notice apply? You've got two cases saying opposite things. Um, if you assume it does, you've also got to work out, is there another notice regime that could be applicable? And you've got to pick your notice regime. You might want to comply with both. But the point is, this is tricky for yards. You need to start giving notices more often wherever you can. The next uh, scenario, I think, 
in the interest of time, I shall, I shall jump over, but it's, it's in the slides because um, I want to look at a scenario that I've seen often uh, 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 with Chinese yards. And that's where a Chinese yard is asked to make a modification. The parties can't agree on the amount of time as an extension and the Chinese yard gets on with it, trying to help the buyer in, in a sort of good faith, goodwill way. Um, but does that ever give rise to an extension of time, right? Well, here you've got a case that should serve as a warning to you. So let's assume we're acting for the yard. The buyer asks for modifications. Article five sets out the method for agreeing uh, extension times for, for, for modifications. <coughs> but at the time, the parties aren't able to agree on an extension of time. The yard being eager to please cracks on with it. Uh, then the buyer terminates for 180 days delay. And the yard says, well, um, can we have an extension of time for, for this modification, this extra work that we did, um, although we didn't agree it at the time, and do we need to give an Article 8 to notice? Now, morally, you might think, well, yes, maybe, maybe you should, but um, the reality of the law says that uh, the contract, this was Mr. Justice Butcher's view, the contract doesn't provide for an unagreed modification extension of time scenario. Pausing there a moment, the contract's supposed to deal with everything. Um, and here we have our first example of how it doesn't quite deal with something. Um, Mr. Justice Butcher said, the parties are free to enter into a collateral ad hoc agreement on their uh, extension of time for this modification. But the very basis of the scenario is the parties can't agree and one party decides to get on with it to help, to, to, to be a good sport in, in, the, in helping the buyer. And also Mr. Justice Butcher said, no Article 8.2 notice would be needed in this scenario. Well, it sort of makes sense when there's no extension right. Um, uh, we'll, we'll leave that there. But the, the, the rule of thumb is uh, always give a notice, always try to agree at the time, try to stick to how the contract works and the modification provisions. Because if not, um, you're, you, you may not as a yard be entitled to an extension of time when you, you hoped for one. Uh, you, you must read and implement the contract uh, very carefully. Now, again, in the interest of time, I, I don't have, I'm, I'm planning to skip over uh, scenario three. Um, feel free to read it in your own time, but I, I would suggest that uh, adding the words at the yard's option um, mm. to an SAJ form caused uh, an issue. I point you to the judgment uh, and think about if you're drafting a contract, what words you do or don't want to add into a contract. So rule of thumb, mm. are on the side of giving notices, draft carefully. Very quickly, remote hearings. They are currently uh, happening a huge, uh, a hugely frequently. Um, they may well um, uh, continue um, when things are back to normal uh, all around the world, um, or at least hybrid hearings may be more popular. I wanted to point out that, that you don't have to be afraid of, of virtual hearings. They're an opportunity um, to present in a different way and to prevent, present uh, <coughs> convincingly to your tribunals. Um, the, we've mentioned the context of the, the, the very complex set of 11 arbitrations. In February, March this year, four weeks of those arbitration hearings were heard in a sort of hybrid remote fashion. And the Jiangsu Groshin case in the High Court was uh, uh, actually heard completely remotely. And uh, I spoke with counsel on the other side about adjusting the way in which we were going to present our submissions. And it was very pleasing to read the comments of the judge on that, saying that uh, the oral submissions were by way of telephone link because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but was highly effective. Each counsel made focus, clear and helpful submissions. And I did not consider that anything of significance was lost, even though we were more concise and, and pithy in our submissions very very quickly these are my five tips for remote hearings there are, there are more tips but these are probably the top five preparation to be pithy you need to prepare for even longer you need to prepare your technical setup you need to practice it many hours before so that if there's an issue with your internet um, if uh, there's an issue with a microphone you can you can change your setup in those 48 hours you can't prevent building work suddenly happening outside your window but but you can do as much as you can to prepare um, think about your audience, try and be concise. It's very difficult to watch a screen all day. Um, uh, it's very difficult to follow. I don't know if you've been finding what I've been saying difficult to follow, apologies if so. Uh, 
but essentially you've got to be concise. You've got to use props and signposting, say what's coming up, say where you've been, where you're going. Breaks, allow mental breaks, um, allow uh, coffee breaks, um, check for dropouts. If anybody disappears, say, can everybody hear me? You don't want to make the best submissions of your life to find out that half the tribunal on the other side didn't hear it. The transcript, think about how things look on a transcript. If there's delay on the line, it can look like you're talking over a witness that you're cross-examining. Try and avoid that. Make sure you get on transcript that they've understood um, at their end. Equipment, sort of the same point. Uh, uh, but test the, the whole equipment infrastructure with your instructing solicitors, with your counsel, with your client, um, and with your witness, you need to set that up a long time in advance. Documents, this is probably the key thing, I think, and, and, and I'll finish soon after this. Um, uh, document management is often an area where Chinese lawyers uh, have, have got room to learn and, 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 and grow in the management of, of document heavy arbitrations right from the start. And now with electronic bundles, electronic platforms, that's become even more important. So I think there's, there's almost a new job title, a new role that's, that's emerging of managing electronic doc, documents um, uh, for presentation in, in electronic and virtual hearings. Um, I'll, I'll cut over the rest, but essentially, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for all the people who've organized this, especially uh, Lin Zhang, and uh, good, luck, good luck to you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much indeed, Andrew. And um, that's a, a very um, interesting survey of what is actually a very complicated subject. Uh, but it is an area which, for those of you who are practitioners involving uh, shipbuilding contract disputes, who are advising in particular shipyards, but possibly also buyers, <coughs> to really understand thoroughly. Uh, the SAG form, which Andrew referred to, is of course the form of the society, uh, the, the Shipbuilders Association of Japan, I'm sorry, which is very largely adopted by Chinese uh, shipyards. And the provisions that Andrew referred to, um, we have seen over and over again. And um, we have seen shipyards being tripped up over and over again particularly because of a failure to give notice of uh, an anticipated delay. <coughs> so Andrews, I'm always keen to expand my vocabulary and I think Andrew referred to this as a rule of thumb, which I now discover in Chinese is uh, translated as something like mu zhi gui zi. But uh, your mu zhi gui zi is always to give notice if you have any doubt about whether um, uh, something is a delay which may fall within the contract and where you may be pr protected. There is a, a cultural issue here. I know from speaking to many Chinese lawyers that shipyards are sometimes too polite to send notices to buyers which they think are too aggressive somehow um, in, in the context of uh, laying the foundations for a claim for delay. But they, they can then be a very, very serious risk of the buyer being able to terminate the contract because uh, the shipyard has simply failed uh, to comply with what is an administrative requirement of the shipyard. So shipyards need to be geared up to do that, to identify potential delays and to send notices to the buyer whenever there is, uh, there is really any, any doubt about the matter. Um, I will be speaking in one of the later seminars also about the question of virtual hearings. Uh, Andrew and I, as you have heard, were involved in some virtual hearings earlier this year and there are some interesting lessons to be learned from that. The LMAA has in fact published guidelines for the conduct of uh, virtual and semi-virtual hearings, and I hope uh, that some of you will read those. They have in fact been published in Chinese on, on uh, Wei Xin, on the uh, uh, Zuku uh, uh, website, and uh, I hope you may have an opportunity to look at those. Uh, can we now move on to uh, Chris Kidd's presentation? Chris is a very uh, experienced um, uh, practitioner as a solicitor and partner in Inson Co in, uh, in London and the head of their um, very large section which deals with shipbuilding contracts and uh, uh, contracts in, in, in um, the offshore field. And uh, Chris is going to talk to us about the uh, impact of COVID and uh, indeed about uh, delay claims. So I think we'll uh, follow on from some of the things we've uh, already said. Thank you, Chris.
Ian, thank you very much. And um, good afternoon to all of you in the Asia Pacific region. For those listening in Europe, uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to have been given this opportunity by the Shanghai Maritime University and the LMAA to participate uh, in this webinar. Uh, and over the next few minutes, um, uh, having already heard about some of the issues arising in recent times concerning um, the prevention principle uh, and refund guarantees, I'd like to spend uh, some time talking about some of the further legal issues that we're seeing, particularly relating to the um, issues arising out of uh, COVID-19. Um, not only will these be important in dealing with um, the problems that have arisen, uh, but they will also be important, uh, I, I think, for those of you who are involved in negotiating new contracts in these difficult times. Could we have the um, slides up, please? I'm not sure if we've yet um, got those. I'll press on anyway. Um, Well, as I'm sure that um, many of you are aware, most shipbuilding contracts contain liquidated damages um, provisions, which is usually the buyer's remedy for delay, uh, and they can't usually claim loss of earnings. Um, however, there are usually provisions to allow the delivery date to be extended in the event that the delay is caused by a force majeure event. And if that delay exceeds the defined number of days, the buyer's usually got the right to terminate the contract. Now, as well as I'm sure many of you are familiar, um, issues arising out of the yard seeking extensions of time for delay as a result of COVID-19 to avoid claims for liquidated damages or possibly cancellation have been cropping up over the past few months. Initially, these were served following closure by the Chinese government of shipyards during the extended Chinese New Year holiday, but they have continued following further disruption to the supply chains, the travel restrictions on surveyors and service engineers, uh, even though most of the yards um, are now back at work. Can we have the next slide, please? <clears throat> so if one receives a force majeure notice, um, what needs to be considered? or indeed if one is giving a force majeure notice what needs to be considered. And talking to many clients, I'm often left with the impression that the contract's negotiated, but then it's simply put on a shelf whilst the important business of actually building the contract work goes ahead. The project team's given the specification to get on with the project, but otherwise has more pressing concerns than monitoring compliance with the terms of the contract. For a time, everything goes well, but then an issue arises. Discussions follow and attempts are made to try and resolve things amicably, but they fail. It's not until much later in the process that someone, very often it's a lawyer, asks what the position is under the contract. And it's only at that stage that the contract's located and consulted. I often think that that's a huge waste of time and money that was spent in negotiating the contract in the first place. Because the simple truth is very often that the party that has stuck to the letter of the contract is likely to be in a much stronger position. So the first question then is, is there a force majeure event? Force majeure doesn't actually exist under English law as a concept, and so it has to be defined in the contract. Very often one sees um, a number of events included in the list that might apply in the present situation. So obviously epidemics and pandemics might be one item, but also uh, any government requisition, control, intervention, requirement or interference um, is another event that frequently occurs. Lockouts uh, or other industrial actions possibly might apply. Also, circumstances beyond the builder's control. Um, we've already heard from Andrew in that regard, but uh, it, it's something that might also be applying in the COVID-19 situation. Subcontractors delay uh, is another one that could well apply. Also, act of God. Now, this one's not so clear, 
and there's a debate to be had about whether a pandemic uh, is an act of God. It may well depend on whether it's a sudden irresistible act of nature and an unforeseeable uh, event without any human agency. The next item to consider is, was the notice served in time? If it's too late, it may well defeat the claim. There may also be a need for a second notice when the event has passed. What we are seeing is issues arising as to whether more than one notice is needed. So for example, the Chinese New Year shutdown caused the initial delay, but further delays arise because of subsequent impacts on different aspects of the supply chain. Is all of that going to be covered by the first notice or are the further notices going to be required? Is the notice properly addressed and sent in the right way? Does it contain the right information and is it required to clearly identify and specify when the delay starts and stops? Furthermore, is there a need for the buyer to serve a response? Failure to do so might mean that it is deemed to be accepted. Can we have the next slide, please? So what does the builder need to prove um, to successfully claim for a force majeure delay? Well, it's usually got to prove that non-performance was due to circumstances beyond its control and where there are no reasonable steps that it could have taken to avoid or mitigate the event or its consequences. It's also got to prove that delivery is delayed very usually, i.e. that there's critical delay caused. The importance of this, I find, is often not really fully understood. The builders usually got the burden of proof and will need to get together the necessary evidence, and this is vital to showing that the critical path on the project has actually been delayed by the particular event. So to succeed, what the builder usually needs to show is that the impact of the particular event did in fact have a delaying effect on the delivery date and not just delay that, uh, that particular activity. So as a result, uh, the builder's got to produce detailed factual evidence showing, for example, what were the critical activities that were planned to be taking place after and were dependent upon the initial activity, which is said to have been delayed by the force majeure event. The evidence of what state the works had reached when the event took place should also be provided. The focus must therefore be on the effect of the delaying events on the critical path to delivery at the relevant time. And I can't stress that enough because all too often I find in cases that shipyards and contractors in the offshore oil and gas industry don't get close to establishing that. But also, um, not just the uh, contractors and the builders, but also their delay ana analysis often don't come close to meeting the standards that are required to succeed with such a claim, either because they haven't actually got the evidence to prepare the case properly, or if they do, their an analyses aren't formulated um, in the correct way. <coughs> Can we have the next slide, please? So I think what we can take from that is that it's clear that good record keeping is vital. Documents, documents, documents. Um, in a dispute resolution process, whether it's in court or arbitration, more weight will be placed on what the contemporaneous documents show or what they say rather than, than what a witness says. So preparing, filing and retrieving records, including electronic records and emails, uh, is absolutely essential to supporting and defending claims as well. Uh, and not only that, but also preparing properly for negotiations. Uh, and if they fail, then the subsequent arbitration or court hearings. But other records are, are also important. So for example, videos, photographs, um, and, and so on. In a recent case where we were acting for a buyer who cancelled um, some offshore supply vessels following excessive delay by the yard, the yard tried to blame the delays onto the buyer. Uh, however, the buyer had very good records and could show day by day what progress had been made. And when the arbitrators looked at the photographs that were produced 
on a day-by-day -day basis, it was obvious that the Yard's credibility was severely damaged. And in the end, the arbitrators rejected um, all of the shipyard's evidence. The records, therefore, are, are, are vital, and it's vital to record the progress as it's actually happening. Actual prog progress and the real story evidenced at the time is absolutely invaluable. Next slide, please. So what if the buyer supervision team experiences difficulties in attending inspections, tests and trials, uh, or in providing the delivery crew in good time? Um, or it might be, and this has been happening, delay in providing owner furnished equipment, you know, commissioning engineers, um, and so on. And there's not usually a provision for the buyer to rely on force majeure to extend time for it to take delivery. And that's a failing in, in, in many contracts in, in the present climate. So it may well mean that it has simply um, not attend uh, or use local surveyors and inspectors or local crew to take delivery, which might, of course, be a greater cost. <coughs> and we have seen situations where the builder tries to use this to say that the buyer has caused delay. And contractors usually have provisions entitling the builder to extensions of time if delay in the buyer's supplies and provisions which entitle the builder to continue in the buyer's absence at inspections, tests and trials, including sea trials, where it's often provided if class attends, it can certify whether the vessel passes. An owner's request to delay might give rise to the builder being entitled to claim a modification, which will involve consideration of the contractual regime for modifications. And this is one particular area, I think, where if one's negotiating new contracts in the present climate, one may want to tighten things up because most of the standard forms that are in existence uh, and the, the, the contracts produced by yards uh, at the early stages of negotiation don't adequately deal with these issues um, in, in the present climate. I hope that that's uh, provided some uh, practical pointers uh, for tackling the issues that will arise um, if you receive a force majeure notice. Uh, and I understand that we'll have some time now to be um, answering some questions. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much indeed, Chris, for, for that uh, exposition and uh, also sharing with us your, your practical, thank you for sharing with us your practical experience of these, uh, of these many cases, many things which look fairly straightforward on paper when you read a contract uh, can only really be understood in the light of the experience of the, the, the cases that we have uh, handled. And I think that there are uh, many things that can be done, uh, particularly by shipyards, to actually improve their position in uh, some of the cases which have arisen, particularly delay. I, I um, very much pick up on the point that you make about record keeping, but I think that the question of record keeping is not only a matter of document management when a dispute has arisen. I think it goes fundamentally to the whole um, planning process, uh, because if a yard does plan uh, using critical path analysis, for example, as most modern yards would do, uh, and I know some Chinese yards do, then it becomes much easier for them to be able to pluck out those documents to show the critical path, uh, because that is actually what they've done and that's what they've used in their planning process. If you have to put everything together simply for the purposes of proving a legal case once a dispute has arisen, then it is very much more difficult. So, this, this is not only, uh, how should I say, a litigation management issue, it is also something which really goes to the heart of contract management in shipyards. And I think um, the, the, the uh, uh, managers of shipyards, uh, not only their lawyers, would be well advised to take, take this very, very much to, to heart uh, and it will greatly improve their position uh, in litigation uh, as and when it, uh, it arises. So I, I know we have some questions already, and indeed uh, I think uh, for the first question to uh, to uh, Chris from 
Miss uh, uh, Jing Ren, and um, perhaps uh, I could ask her to ask the first question. Um, hello. Um, my question is to Chris. Um, normally, in the shipbuilding contract, and if the yard can't deliver the ship within the 180 days of the, de of the date of delivery, the buyer can cancel. Uh, but due to COVID-19, um, the shipyards may be closed down or unable to get the labor, um, finance, uh, materials or machinery to build the vessel for many, many months. Um, so my question is, uh, do you suggest that the shipyard should try to extend that to say, um, 360 days, for example, in future negotiation. Thank you. Chris, I think I hope we can be put online. Yes, um, th thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a very good question and it's something that um, parties will have to obviously give thought to. Um, my talk was really focused upon dealing with um, having got the contract in place, how the shipyard would protect its position by uh, against a claim for liquidated damages or indeed a potential cancellation by um, operating the force majeure clause if um, the interruption in supplies to it or the availability of labor, um, or, or indeed there's a, as a, there are very often is a, a clause um, referring to pandemics or epidemics, the yard can protect itself in that way. Um, so I think there's two two ways to do, do it. One, one is to ensure that the force majeure clause is clearly and widely worded to cater for the um, disruption that might apply in the present circumstances. But also the other way is, is as you suggest, is um, to just simply extend the cancellation date and the ultimate drop dead date um, to allow for um, um, uh, delays that, that come along, which might not necessarily quite fall fair and square within the force majeure clause. I, I think one of the problems the yards are facing at the moment is that given that this bombshell has arrived and, and, and hit them and disrupted things so greatly, um, is that it's not very easy to plan at the moment, um, looking forwards as to quite how things are going to play out in terms of the supply chain. So that would be another good way of um, protecting themselves, as you suggest. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. I think uh, we have some more questions. I think possibly one directed at me uh, from uh, Julia Ju, I think. Are you able to put Julia online? Hello, Julia. Sorry, you're muted, I think. <coughs> you may need to, need to unmute yourself. Well, John, can you can you deal with that? If not, I can. I think I've got a note of your question here. Okay, so we seem to be having um, a little difficulty in uh, in, in uh, unmuting you, Julia. I'm sorry about that, but. Um, I think the first question uh, you wanted to put was uh, that a buyer, if a buyer commences arbitration to claim a refund and um, uh, interest, perhaps I better start that again, I'm not quite sure where that was picked up on the recording. If a buyer commences arbitration to claim a refund and interest against the shipyard, during the arbitral proceedings, the shipyard is ordered by the court to enter into bankruptcy process and is dissolved disappears before the arbitration award is published, um, can the refund bank um, uh, escape from liability under the refund guarantee? Um, this is an interesting question, I think, uh, um, in relation to bankruptcy generally. Um, there seems to be uh, a, almost an assumption that, that the bankruptcy proceedings will automatically uh, lead to an arbitration being suspended. That, that, that first of all, can I, point out that that is not the case. If an ar arbitration seated in London is proceeding, the only way in which the arbitrators can be stopped from proceeding is if an application is made to the English court under what are called the cross-border insolvency regulations, 
um, in which case the court can order the uh, arbitrators to stop or to uh, suspend the proceedings until the insolvency administrator has the opportunity to possibly get the um, shipyard, perhaps it is, uh, up and running again or possibly to, to organize a sale. Um, if we go back to the categorization of refund guarantees and if the refund guarantee is properly understood as a, um, an on-demand bond, i.e. something which is in effect independent of the underlying obligation, there should be no problem in the buyer ultimately collecting under that um, refund guarantee uh, irrespective of the insol insolvency of the shipyard. It may be that the wording of the guarantee will result in the payment being postponed until the arbitration has been completed, but I think that it would be possible to complete the arbitration and to issue an arbitration award, uh, even though the, um, the shipyard in question had actually been dissolved. Very often the authorities who are responsible for striking a company off the register uh, will postpone doing that if they're notified of the fact that there may be claims against that company before um, it, it is stru actually struck off. Um, so that it may be that, that the buyer in those circumstances would also be wise to uh, try to prevent the company being, being actually struck off, even though it's been uh, through a, a formal insolvency um, proceeding. So um, I hope that answers the question. If the uh, refund guarantee were to be treated as a, uh, something like a see to it guarantee, then, then I think there would be much more um, problem in, in a case such as that. I don't know whether, Julia, are you back online? Can, can we hear you now? Uh, no, it's still, we still seem to be having some trouble with the sound. Um, so I think you also asked, what will the refund bank's position be if the shipyard is dissolved before, before the buyer starts arbitration? Well, um, I think in that case, uh, I may actually misunderstand the position, but the claim could be made, um, let, let's say that the, the buyer would probably terminate the shipbuilding contract um, in order to be able to get access to the, to the refund. Um, if the shipyard had been dissolved by that point, then the, there may be a question as to whether arbitration could be started, but it is usually the shipyard which starts an arbitration to block the payment out under a refund guarantee. The buyer um, is, is, is interested in, in collecting. So it is a very standard tactic in fact, by shipyards when faced with um, a claim for termination of the contract to almost automatically give notice of arbitration even if they really don't think there's any prospect of success because that will block the um, payment out under the refund guarantee at least for some period until the arbitration has been completed. Mm -hmm. Um, if the, the buyer had been um, dissolved before the um, notice of termination was given, which is pretty unlikely, I think, should be, um, then I think that the claim under the refund guarantee could proceed. And certainly if the refund guarantee is treated as being an on-demand bond rather than a secondary security, then I think there should be no problem in, in obtaining payment. Out. I mean, there was a, a, a large case I was concerned with in, career where a bond was claimed, um, it didn't have this arbitration deferment provision in it, but a claim was made under the bond. And um, the buyer did in fact claim that the shipyard was insolvent within the definition in the termination provision in the shipbuilding contract. It ultimately turned out that it wasn't, um, but nevertheless the, um, the bond issuer paid out um, so, in, in fact, it turned out to be a, a case of an, um, an improper uh, or invalid termination of the shipbuilding contract leading to a successful claim under a bond. I think the, the lesson there is that the shipyard and the bond issuer have to be very clear about the wording and to make sure that they do include the, um, the arbitration deferment provision, which one now does commonly see in, in, in most of these bonds. So, um, John, do we have any other questions? If not, I think probably we're all exhausted and we can have uh, time to, to bring proceedings to an end.
So, well, I think it then remains... Ian, I received question. notice of a question, actually, I should say. Another um, question, I'm sorry. J John sent me a question. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, 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 for, for, for interruption, um, thank you very much indeed, um, Ian. Uh, and we have got uh, uh, questions from our audience, and uh, which we will uh, uh, propose uh, them to the speakers. And Julia, uh, uh, who we can not hear uh, on the line, uh, she has actually got two questions. One is to you, Ian, uh, and the other is to Andrew. Uh, if you and Andrew uh, do mind, then I will uh, put that question to Andrew. Is that okay? Okay, absolutely. Yes, uh, I'll uh, read out the question on behalf of uh, uh, Julia uh, Ju. Uh, to Andrew, uh, notice is quite important for delay and extension issue. Uh, if buyer's own fault causes delay, and the shipbuilding contract expressly allows extension for that, say buyer fails to pay the third installment, uh, does the yard need still to give notice to the buyer uh, in uh, bearing mind that the uh, notice uh, clause or term in the shipping building contract is quite uh, far reaching? Uh, if buyer's own fault causes delay, but the shipbuilding contract is not expressly another uh, issue situation, uh, the shipbuilding contract does not expressly allow extension, say buyer destroyed uh, the finished blocks. Uh, does the yard still need to give notice to the buyer uh, to uh, seek extension? Andrew, can you hear me? I can, I can hear you, yes. Um, that's uh, an excellent set of questions. Um, thank you very much for for uh for sharing those i didn't quite catch who they're from but they are very good questions um the first the first thing i would say that it's this is my favorite type of question because it's the type of question that smacks of of a, an actual real life case <laughs> so the first thing to say is um uh the wording although i've i've presented that table the the saj form table um, that's obviously a table setting out how one amended SAJ form contract works and every contract will turn on its individual wording and these issues the reason why that table is so helpful is often these issues uh, are answered these questions are answered by looking at how the whole of the contract works and fits together so um, it's an excellent question to which I can't give an answer, but I can tell you how, how, uh, how these things turned out in the Jiangsu case on, on the basis of the Jiangsu Groshin contract wording. And, and as an aside, I've just said how important the table is, how useful it is when you're fitting together your own contract that you're looking at. I've already received some messages on Zoom saying that's a really helpful table. I'm going to share it with my shipbuilding clients. My, uh, my Chinese name is An Suwei. Uh, like Ju and Sui. Uh, so in a way, uh, and that's an apt name for the table because it's about planning, knowing what's coming up, giving notices when you need to, avoiding the fight or being able to win the fight when, when it happens. So feel free to refer to it now around China as the An Sui table. But essentially, if, if you apply um, the Jiangsu wording to the first part of your question, does a payment delay to a payment of an installment entitle you to an extension. The answer in the Jiangsu case on that particular wording was uh, there is an automatic right to an extension under that contract, um, a day by day extension for each day that the payment is late. But in that specific contract, unlike the, the normal, the default, the original unamended SAJ form wording, some words were added saying there's an extension at the yards option and the indication from the Jiangsu Groshin Tribunal and the High Court was that it would have been an automatic extension for which no notice was needed but because the words at the yards option were added all of a sudden the yard needs to communicate the exercise of that option so even though no notice of a delay event is necessarily needed because of the change to that word, very simple changing to the wording, um, all of a sudden notice of some kind was needed. So again, this goes back to when you're drafting, be very careful what changes you make to these contracts. And when you're living the project, be very careful of what notices were needed, give notices if you can. The second question, um, if, if uh, I think it was if the buyer destroyed the blocks, I mean, we're sort of back in the scenario that I, that I 
put forward something that the buyer does to to cause delay to the to the building project i mean again on the jiangsu uh uh wording you have what mr justice butcher said if if it's an event that's beyond the control of the seller so something that the buyer's done uh it falls within article 81 and then you follow through the consequences of that and an article 8 to uh notice but obviously every contract is different and say your contract in article 81 or whatever number is given to that article in your contract says beyond the control of the parties um query, query whether it would fall within article 81 so essentially um excellent questions to which the answer could take an arbitration and a high court appeal to, to get the answer but essentially you've got to study your contracts really carefully you've got to see how it works overall and that's why the the answer way table is is probably a, a useful tool. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, I hope that that uh, uh, answers the uh, the question. Um, John, do we have some more questions? Uh, no, uh, we have run out of time. So uh, we, we do have uh, more questions and one raised by Nicholas uh, Shi of uh, Costco and the other is uh, raised by Jessica. Uh, uh, but I'm afraid that we uh, may not have uh, a time to uh, go ahead with those two uh, long questions. And what we will do is uh, we'll give those questions to uh, the speakers and the speakers can uh, buy uh, WeChat or other means to answer those questions. Uh, Absolutely. We, we, we're very happy to, to answer those questions that um, you've got there and indeed any other questions from uh, participants who might want to uh, raise anything offline with us uh, about any of the topics we've covered or uh, shipbuilding perhaps more generally. I think, uh, John, if I can hand over to you to, again to, uh, to close our proceedings, but before you do that, if I can give my particular thanks uh, to you for the organization of this event and uh, uh, to Shanghai Maritime University and our uh, other speakers. And uh, it's been a, a, an excellent uh, occasion from our point of view from the LMAA. And uh, we look forward to the uh, other seminars which are coming up in the next two weeks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Ian Gong, um, Mr. Uh, and uh, our three very short words. One is happy birthday uh, to LMA, uh, London Maritime Arbitrators Association. Uh, it's the 16th uh, anniversary of this wonderful organization. Uh, no uh, other arbitration international, uh, purely international maritime arbitration commissions or organizations have had such a long, long life. And uh, of course, we will, you will, LMA will have uh, a more uh, post practice uh, in the future. Then, uh, secondly, is uh, let's also thank very much for our uh, co organizers at the Shanghai Power Association and the Shanghai Arbitration Commission, and also uh, the two supporting organizations, uh, CC and uh, the World Maritime University uh, Shanghai. And uh, last but not least, we'll have another uh, two uh, webinars uh, next week and the week after. Um, all on uh, Thursday afternoon. Uh, so we'll uh, send you uh, our uh, beloved uh, audience and speakers uh, the link to join in uh, those two future seminars uh, together with uh, those uh, notes for joining those seminars. And we uh, are delighted and very much to see you again and again uh, online uh, on uh, those webinars organized by LMA and SMU. So for time being, uh, we say bye-bye, but next Tuesday, uh, we want to see you again.